All right, here we go. Part four, Carly Griggs murder trial. So where we left off in part three is we had testimony from the doctor here of uh, the Zoloft. She started out with 25 milligrams. They It wasn't doing anything. They upped it to 50 milligrams. Then she didn't like the way it made her feel. She was zombie-like and just spacey. So they subscribed her Lexapan, Lexapro. I guess it's Lexapro. 5 milligram. So it must be more potent than the uh, Zoloft. So, and then obviously the doctor said that, you know, that she had to slowly wing herself off of the 50 milligram Zoloft, and then she continued with the 5 milligram Lexapan. She claims she stopped taking the Zoloft. All right. So I think this is building a case that the medicine affected her judgment. This is just my assumption so far is why they were bringing this up on the defense's side. So then he went over a litany of uh, things that were uh, wrong with her. Uh, bipolar, bipolar 2, schizophrenia. They touched upon uh, delusion. Um, disillusion, rather. Yeah, disillusion, depression, uh, manic. He covered manic depression, the difference between the different types of depression and how it elevates and how it... How she was describing herself being, um, like there's different highs and lows at like, what, 60% of the time she's depressed, 20% of the time she's, she's moderate, I guess, and then the rest is she feels okay. Okay, that's, you know, layman's term there. Uh, they talked about the biological dad and the trauma that she suffered from him being interacting with him. They also discussed with the good doctor uh, the death of her sister. I believe her sister was 18 months old. Uh, Carly was six at the time or four, four I don't know, either four or six, or maybe she was four at the time that her, her uh, sibling passed away from an illness. And then at the age of six, she claims she says she was hearing voices for the first time. And the voices told her that she's better than everybody else. Yeah, that, this is what she, she has said. Now, they have went over all this information he has. He's gathering it from a four-hour interview with her post-murder. Post she, you know, he he interviews her, talks to her after she kills the um, her mother, and also he's getting it from some journals she had in her room. She had a sketch pad, and apparently there was uh, like three objections, three different times that the defense is wanting his findings. Uh, put into evidence so i don't know they they just had sidebars and came back so as at this point i don't know why they're objecting to it because prior to that um they had had the jury not in the room and then they were talking about well this was in uh day two at the end of day two to put his findings in to where the, the prosecution objected to it, the defense wanted the his comment on, which I don't know why the defense didn't want it in there, okay? Uh, or, I'm sorry, the prosecution of, uh, where he makes a comment that he can't definitively say that it was the medicine that had caused her to have this temporary insanity, this uh, dissolution of momentary she doesn't know what she's doing kind of thing, which I thought, well, who cares if that's in there or not, right? I don't know. I'm not an expert. <clears throat> I'm not an attorney. I'm sure they have their reasons. But the, ju the judge said, yes, it's going in. And because he doesn't want to see this 
case come back through because she could use that as an appeal later down the road that they didn't allow obviously certain testimony coming in so he's like let it come in and i'm like yay let the chips fall where they may so far in the trial my opinion is i don't think his testimony so far is convincing me carly didn't know what she was doing so there we have that that is the lowdown of where we are in this case so far and let's get the rest the defense is still he's still on d defense direct and man look we're at five five hours and 20 minutes so this might be uh part four part five because you know we don't want the videos getting too long and people can watch things at their leisure if anybody is watching me cover this <laughs> so we're going to dive into this, and I am, I don't know, I haven't skimmed forward at all or not. You know, I stopped it when I finished up yesterday uh, doing, I did two videos yesterday, part uh, three and four, or part uh, two and three, and this is part four, that uh, the, the prosecution's not on direct yet, and I am looking forward to, how, what are they, how are they going to, you know, cross-examine him, question him, and are they going to talk about the video of her? Now, obviously, he's going to be speculating on her body language and her behavior. Does she seem out of thing? And, and, and have they talked to any teachers, any anybody who interacted with her at school that day? I haven't seen any. I mean, we're only on day three, and this trial went pretty fast. Um, cause it, it, it is over and I know you guys know, no, it's over, but just, I'm just wanting to go through it. I'm fascinated about everything that that's happening and what leads to the, uh, the final judgment, but I haven't seen so far, nobody from the school, a teacher. I mean, maybe that's yet to come, but when I started this yesterday, the judge asked how, well, how, because he was getting irritated with him, by the way. He was getting irritated with them because they didn't have the prosecution didn't have stuff printed out for the defense, and then the defense didn't have the the video from um, the 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 officer that found her on the side of the road. His body cam. Oh, it was a mess. He was getting mad, and then they had to figure out what what's going to be admissible and this kind of stuff. But uh, man, and here we are. Here we are, and that the, and the, and the judge said, "Well, do you have anybody else to come on while we're waiting for this to get printed out and the the video to be?" And she's like, "No." The defense said, "No." That's the only two people she had for yesterday. I mean, yeah, well, for day three rather, um, because I am. It is past tense, but it's present tense right now for me. But uh, do they not have anybody else? I mean, she said no. So I don't know if this is it or not. I haven't dived to search for because I wanted it all to be fresh to me. I want to get a fresh reaction and fresh to know, you know, see what's going on. All right, let's get into it. Let's go. Can you, ex can you explain the significance of bipolar 2 disorder and dissociation and the auditory hallucinations? Oh, so in the period of time up until March 12th, Carly reported that um, her mood was flat, that she was zombie, that she was still quite depressed, she was still cutting. She also reported that the voices were getting worse, um, that they were becoming more urgent, more prominent, um, and, and, and she was beginning to worry that, that, that they were taking over for her. Now, she told me that the only thing the voices said to her were things that were um, 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 kind of elitist, like you're better than those people. Like that's the only Narcissistic. thing she told me uh, they said. Um, so her mood is poor, the voices are getting worse, um, her sleep continues to be bad, and she's smoking marijuana on a, on a, on a, two or three times a week. 
She also reported that she had a fair amount of anxiety um, during this time as well. So wait a second. So now you're saying that she's been hearing voices this whole time? Am I getting this right? Oh, and I forgot to mention the cutting when I went going through the list of litany things. And I was wanting to see some evidence of the cutting. Did they take a picture of her leg? She should have some scarring if she's been cutting for two years. I know someone that did this when they were a teenager. And yes, they have scarring on their arm. And it was superficial cuts, just like he said the, uh, earlier that it was superficial cuts. But look, let's get back to the schizophrenia, the voices. So she, she's, all of this is getting worse. She's hearing voices. What, what's going on here? What? She should have been in some kind of uh, hospital or something. Did her did? Look, I don't recall the stepdad ever saying he he never mentioned schizophrenia. He said he never saw her whatever. She's just a kid. All right, let's go. Cause dad, blame. Your Honor, may I approach? Dr. Clark, when did you first receive the final court records? So I received the vital core records are the records from the Rankin County Correctional Facility for her um, psychiatric treatment and medication. And I didn't receive them until I had already um, interviewed uh, Carly. Um, I, had already, I'd, I had returned to Boston uh, and, um, and, and got, the, uh, got the records afterwards, so I wasn't able to ask Carly questions about the records. And that's because we had not yet received the records from vital core from the subpoena, is that correct? That's my yeah, understanding. Well, why didn't they wait? What was the hurry? Why why didn't he wait for all the records, all the information? He can review that information that's available to him about her. I mean, she's only 14 years old at the time. How much information can there be? I don't know. Just say it. How much doctor information, her psychiatrist's information... I know some of it's confidential, but he's a psychiatrist too, and we're we're dealing with uh, she she's on trial for for murder. Why would they not have all this information? Why he can't ask her questions? So this is going to cause problems with his interview with her. There's facts left out. That's my opinion, anyway. Copy of the vital court records for Carly, uh, okay. beginning I think March twenty eighth, twenty twenty four. And are those the same records you reviewed? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me what stood out to you in those records? There were at least a couple of things. There were several things that stood out, actually. Um, one is, and I, I think I was, I was quite surprised to see, Carly reported to the clinicians at Vital Corps on March 28th, and then again a month later, that she'd been having command auditory hallucinations. What are command auditory hallucinations? So hallucinations... Auditory hallucinations are hearing voices, and they can you know, they can be of different content. They're often critical, for example. Um, but command of auditory hallucinations is when you hear a voice that tells you to do something. It's fairly common. The voices will often, when you have person has this, the voices often tell you to either hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. Um, it, they're very concerning as a psychiatrist. If someone says they're having command auditory hallucinations, it's very concerning because some people act on. Them people act on them. I had asked Carly several different times whether she was having, whether she had had command auditory hallucinations when I interviewed her. She said no, very definitively each time. So I was surprised to see that she had told the vital core clinicians that in fact she'd been having command auditory hallucinations, uh, including ones that were telling her to hurt her mother. And based on the records you reviewed, when did the auditory hallucinations stop for Carly? So Carly reported these, hallucinate, these command auditory hallucinations in March and then again in April and then, and then, and then I think by May they had, they had stopped. And two things had happened. One is that Carly had been taken off the Lexapro. So Carly, we haven't really talked about Lexapro. Carly had been put on Lexapro on March 12th, one week before the incident. She was continued on Lexapro 
um, when she came to uh, the correctional facility, they increased the dose of Lexapro um, one, 10 days after she had arrived there. She continued to report auditory hallucinations. And a month later, they took her off the Lexapro. Um, and it was after that, she said the hallucinations stopped. But the other thing that happened at the same time, Carly was put on an antipsychotic medication. Called, what medication was she put on? She was put on Abilify, also known as Aripiprazole. So on March 28th, she reported these auditory hallucinations. She was diagnosed with major depressive disorder with psychotic features and treated with an antipsychotic medication, Abilify. Um, and then uh, uh, in, 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 in April, the dose of Abilify was increased from five to seven and a half milligrams. Uh, and the Lexapro was stopped. So those two medication changes occurred and Carly reported subsequently that the voices had gone away. What dosage, was her dosage of Abilify raised at any point again? Yes, at the time that I saw Carly in the end of August, she was on, she reported being on 10 milligrams a day of Abilify, and that's what the records would reflect starting, starting in July. And what stood out to you about that dosage? So when I first met, when I met with Carly, she told me she was on Abilify. I didn't know what dose she was on, and she didn't know. She told me the Abilify had been really helpful for her. Typically, in my experience with adolescents who've never been on an antipsychotic before, I'll use one or two milligrams of Abilify. It's a very, can be a very potent medication, can be very sedating. And typically, what I see with adolescents, especially those that have not been on antipsychotics before, is they might be on two milligrams, maybe four, maybe five. Um, Carly told me, or I found out, that she was on 10 milligrams a day, um, which, which surprised me. I, I, it is rare for me to see a teenager on that high a dose unless they've either have really significant behavioral problems and been on a lot of antipsychotics before or they have a serious mental illness like schizophrenia. Okay. And what's the highest dose of Abilify? So typically 10 to 15 milligrams a day is considered the maximum dose. Abilify is an antipsychotic medication used to treat conditions like schizophrenia most typically, again, 10 to 15 milligrams a day. It's also used for many other things, right? It's used to help with depression. It's used to help with a kind of emotional over overload. It's used to help, it's a mood stabilizer. Um, but 10 to 15 milligrams a day is kind of the typical uh, um, upper, upper limit. Okay. It, what if any issues, um, when you spoke with Mr. Smiley, what if any issues did he note for you in regards to Carly having time loss or memory loss issues? Can I apologize for just yes. one? I actually had not finished answering your last question. Oh, I'm sorry. Question. Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Um, if I may, you had asked me about the significance of the records. Yes. In addition to seeing, in addition to Carly reporting these command auditory hallucinations, including those that hurt her mother, um, and the fact that she, well, the fact that she denied it to me and had denied it to the other investigator, the other uh, uh, expert, um, I thought was really quite striking. Um, I just, I, I thought it was quite striking. Um, and so what I took from that is that it was most likely that Carly was denying and minimizing the auditory hallucinations. I thought, I mean, I, you know, I have to think, is she malingering here, right? Is she, isn't this convenient? that she's coming up with this story now after she's been arrested, right? That's like, the, like probably the central question. I would think if she was malingering, she'd be leading with this. The voices told me to do it. She denied it up and down uh, with me. So the fact that she had had it now was saying, no, yeah, no, I thought was really fit with the pattern that she was de denying and minimizing what, what had happened. What do you mean by malingering? Sure, so malingering is when an individual um, um, fakes it, I guess, or comes up with symptoms or exaggerates symptoms for some secondary gain, like to get something. Um, and so, you know, for example, if someone who's, let's say, has an opioid addiction might come into the emergency room complaining of some sort of pain in order to get, they'll make it up in order to get opioid. In this situation, Carly has a lot of incentive to, um, um, to say I, it wasn't my fault. Right. I mean, I mean, obviously, she has a lot of incentive. And so the question is, is she telling us these things now because she wants to try to get out of it? And it I'm, I'm, still, sorry, I'm still giving a long-winded answer to your question. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Question. So, so, so um, um, 
uh, her being on Abilify, I think, is really is very important. And the fact that Carly reports, and she's been very consistent about this, once she got on Abilify, once the Lexapro was stopped, she's felt good. Um, she has felt like her mood is really pretty good, and the mood swings have stopped. So she's very consistent in saying, this works for me. Um, so I think that's striking. The auditory hallucinations, or the disappearing auditory hallucinations, are striking. And then the third thing is, Carly was reported by the clinicians to have been crying every day for months, to be really quite, have been quite distraught, quite depressed, quite hopeless, um, very sad, just, just tearful. Um, from May, I'm sorry, from, from, from April through May and then June. And then since July or August, her mood was much better. She still, I think, misses her mother tremendously, she said to me, but she says her mood is better. I realized I was actually, you know, preparing for this yesterday and I was reading this and I realized the pattern that this represents, I think, is a pattern of what's called um, bipolar depression. A pattern of depression that occurs after <laughs> a manic or a mixed state. So that typically when someone with bipolar disorder has mood elevation or a mixed state, a lot of agitation, it's followed by a crash that they will frequently, for some people, really quite predictably, they'll have a terrible bout of depression, which is deeper and longer lasting than most depressions. It really can be quite, quite awful. Uh, and then they can feel much better. So for me, looking at this, looking at how awful Carly felt for those two or probably three month period of time, and then how much better she felt after that. To me, that's very consistent with the pattern of, again, bipolar depression, depression that, that comes in after having had a, a manic or a hypomanic episode. Okay, so let's say what he's saying really truly applies to Carly. She was disillusioned. She's suffering from depression. She's hearing voices telling her to hurt her mother, hurt herself. She's all of this say, hypothetical. All of this is true. She still should never get out and see the light of day. Again, let's say hypothetically, this wins the day. Carly gets to be free to some extent. Now, maybe there would be, oh, it's all hypothetical, maybe there would be stipulations that she has to stay on medication and be under observation. But look, you can never trust somebody with this type of mental illness. She has acted upon the voices and killed her mother. And got away with it. That's hypothetically if she if this had won the day for them. Right? So I, I'm just throwing that out there that uh even if it's true, even if this if this played into the jury, she should still never be able to be around people. And you can't force people to take their medicines unless there was some stipulation with the courts and then somebody would have to monitor it. She would need to be in some kind of group home. She'd need to be monitored forever. Because, hey, those voices will come back and tell her to hurt somebody. And she will do it. Because all of a sudden she'll be disillusioned. She will have a blackout. She doesn't know what she's doing. Right? This is dangerous. This is dangerous stuff. So, I don't know. I still need to hear some more. We need to hear Cross. What? How is the, the, the prosecution going to chip away at this? Is I'm fascinating because it did get me thinking. This could be a possibility. I have experienced mental illness people in my family. And when they didn't take their medicine, they were dangerous. When they did take their medicine, they were more docile. 
And again, one of them stopped taking his medicine. Because, look, you can't drink alcohol when you're on these these powerful meds. And he would want to stop taking them so he could drink. Because he'd want to drink some beer. The problem is, this is dangerous. These people need to be monitored constantly. Isn't it fair to say, though, that one of the reasons Carly might have been you know, having these daily long crying spells was because of her circumstances? I think that's very fair to say. I think absolutely. I just, I was struck by, I was struck by how distraught she was throughout, really for a long period of time, and then how much better she felt um, relatively, relatively quickly by the end of the summer. Um, where she's still in the same circumstances uh, as, as she was before. What I take from that is there's likely a bi- biological component to that. I'm not saying she didn't miss her mother. I'm not saying this is anything but a terrible position for her to be in. But I think there's a biological component. Okay. And is Abilify the first time, based on your interview of Carly and the record she <clears throat> reviewed, that she was put on an antipsychotic medication? Yes. And, and, and as I mentioned, Abilify can have significant mood stabilizing properties. So in the treatment of bipolar disorder or bipolar two, the first order of business is to stabilize someone's mood. That's sometimes done with a mood stabilizer like lithium, but also medications like Abilify are frequently used to help stabilize someone, someone's mood. And what if any other medications was Carly also on after, uh, after she arrived to the Rankin County Correctional Facility? So she was kept on the Lexapro medication after she arrived. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, on, on, on March 28th, the dose was increased from 5 milligrams to 10 milligrams. And then she was on the Lexapro 10 milligrams for approximately a month. And was she switched to Lex, from Lexapro to another medication? So in, in April, she was switched from Lexapro to a medication called Celexa. And can you tell us a little bit about Celexa? So Celexa is another of the SSRI antidepressant medications commonly used in, in, in both teenagers and adults. Okay. And how is Celexa related to Lexapro? So Celexa and Lexapro are similar medications. Um, I think of them, if you think of all the SSRIs, there are like five or six SSRIs, think of them as cousins. They have similarities but real differences. I think of maybe Lexapro and Celexa as siblings. Um, they have more similarities, but they still have differences. Um, so they are different medications. They have different Food and Drug Administration approvals. They have different responses. People res- can respond differently one to the other, can have different side effects one to the other. And before you, uh, before you diagnose a person or diagnose traits, what methodology do you typically adhere to? Are you speaking of traits or psychiatric diagnosis? I'm not sure I understand. Uh, traits. So, so there is something called mm, personality traits. And I guess I, mean, I should back up and say there's also something called personality disorders. So personality disorders, we've probably heard many of them, like, like for example, narcissistic personality disorder, um, are conditions in psychiatry that are supposed to represent an enduring maladaptive pattern of behavior. So for someone who's, it's like bread in the bone, right? For someone who acts in a certain way on a regular basis in a way that doesn't really doesn't work for them or the people around them, they can be given the diagnosis of a personality disorder. Um, For people that want to kind of point in that direction, but maybe not go as far as say a personality disorder, they can talk about personality traits. Maybe someone has narcissistic traits, for, for example, rather than the full disorder. Well, according to her stepfather, he didn't notice anything different. Am I missing something? Please let me know. Now, I try to take notes and pay attention. That he was directly asked questions about her behavior. Did he see signs of anything? And it was a big no. In fact, why would why would they not bring up Maybe because they didn't want to bring up schizophrenia with him because he's not a doctor. But damn, he lives with her. What is she taking the meds for? Or she may be a little depressed. No, he never mentioned that. Wouldn't he know? Wouldn't that be a red flag? 
I, I don't, I'm trust just trying to get from the past testimony to now that with, with him testifying, he didn't see any signs. And then they're talking about behavioral. It, nobody has said she was different or had a different personality to my recollection to this far. So I don't know. This is kind of, now that just threw another monkey wrench into where I think they were already making strides with me by bringing up she's still hearing the voices, she's doing this, she's doing that. You know, okay, okay, I can see that. I can see that happening. But I, I would think she should never be out. She should be put in a loony bin forever. Anyway, that's my opinion. Even even if, the, if she was hearing voices and she's having this psychosis, all this event that they're talking about, then yeah, she still needs to be locked up because this event, this could happen again. That They build up resistances to this medicine, y'all. They have to switch their medicine. They have to be monitored. And God knows what's going to happen when they do that, right? So these kinds of people... Especially if they've already committed a, a heinous crime, they should never walk amongst us. And I'm not just saying lock them up and throw away the key. That Well, yeah, but I meant like her family supporting her, showing her love and support, but she still never should get out. Would you want her in your home? Hell no. No. No, 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 no. No, it, it it you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You would not be able to sleep at night. At least I would not. But anyway, just bringing up the point that they were just talking about uh, her behavioral, any mood changes. I mean, are we talking civil here? I mean, nobody has said in any testimony. Well, the only person I've seen testify was the stepdad. The rest were officers. The people from the corner. So he's the only one, and he is saying no. And he lives with her. Unless they had something from one of the kids that we didn't get to hear the testimony from. I don't know. There we go. And so, in answer to your question, how do you diagnose, I'll say maybe two things. One is, there's, there hardly ever, in, in actual clinical practice, it's hardly ever done. I, I, I almost never see someone who's been diagnosed with a personality disorder. You read about it a lot, a lot of books on the shelf about, about it. So. But, but um, it's just not very terribly helpful in practice. That's multiple personalities. And personality. it can be really stigmatizing. I mean, if you say, and, and, and what are you going to say to your patient? Oh, I've diagnosed you with narcissistic personality disorder, and <laughs> they will never come back. Um, and you really need to know someone well to do it, right? It's about, it's not just how they are in this particular interview with them, but it's about how they are over time in, in, in many different many different settings. So do you think her demon, the voices, and I'm not trying to be funny, because it does it is it is it can be funny, but look. She's saying she hearing voices. He I wrote notes that the voices said uh she's having hallucinations on a command order hallucination, whatever that disorder is. Ordered her where she would hurt herself or hurt someone else. Okay. So she's going to do that. So did the voices tell her to do this? Was she faking it? Her personality changed? Did, did the demons tell her? Well, we all know that... Earlier, he said that the voices that told her she's better than everybody else. So, let's just say, hypothetically, this voice that she's hearing is narcissistic. I mean, we can laugh, but I mean, it, this is serious stuff because in, people with mental, they, they think this stuff is real. In this, in their, in their psychosis, but I'm just pointing that out because, damn, I, I see a connection. Maybe that's why they're bringing it up because the voice told her she was better than everybody else. So you have, so you have to know a person really quite well if indeed you choose to do it. Okay. And what if any 
signs of personality traits did you observe in Carly? So, I've really testified already, I think. I, you know, I observed her to be somewhat dutiful, to want to be a good kid, to want to please her mother, to be a good student. I mean, she, 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 you know, she had a degree of confidence about being a good student um, and being like one of the smartest kids, smartest kids in the school. And beyond that, I really saw her as, as kind of falling within the normal range of kind of adolescent girl, aside from her mental health conditions. And based on your observations and interview with Carly and, and the documents you reviewed and uh, the her family members that you spoke to. Would you characterize Carly as callous? Really, on the contrary. So callous referring to, I guess, not having feelings, not having empathy. Um, there is a term um, in psychology of callous, unemotional traits, um, typically referring to individuals, many of whom go on to become, uh, have serious um, 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 problems with the law. Individuals who just don't care don't have real attachments, don't have real empathy, um, who are just, I guess, cold um, and often cruel um, and, and limited ability to experience remorse. And I don't see that with Carly at all. Okay. Just observing Carly. Now, I'm not a body language expert. But there, there is, seems to be a disconnect with her. This is from my opinion. And watching her through from day one to now, when she, when those tears would come on and how bad they're coming on. Now, we all saw it. We all saw it. When when the when the dad was uh when they played the nine one one, when they played Lewis's uh body cam footage, the officer that was first on the scene. She she is boohooing. She boohooed during the, the defense's opening statements. She didn't during the prosecution's opening statement. Because the prosecution was saying, Carly did this. Carly did this. Carly went in that room. Carly shot her mom. Carly killed her mom. Her mom's in there. You're going to hear a one call. Blah, 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 blah. I went down the litany. Carly looked visibly scared. Her eyes were going batting back and forth. Go back and watch it. I think each of them's opening statement is a, maybe 30 minutes a piece or so. It's not really long, but it's enough. And here comes, uh, and it was all in day one. A prosecution went up first, then the uh, the defense, and then they, they boom, they started uh, calling people up. Uh, test it all in one day because uh, sometimes opening statements take a really long time but anyway so here comes the, the defense we're going to show that Carly blah 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 and then she has a different take on talking about Carly and Carly is boohooing why would she not boohoo she's scared when the prosecution's talking but she cried when the defense was talking what does that mean that's telling me she's only, she's kind of sociopathic where she's just only, she's feeling sorry for herself. This is a, this is empathy for herself. Now, I could be wrong. I'm not a specialist in anything. I, I'm just, it's so much crap I've watched before, you know, and just trying to pinpoint, and I have a right to my opinion. <laughs> But how about when they were when the when the guy uh, the first detective that was on not not Cotton but the other guy I forgot his name by the way he had a beard on in the video of of Lewis's camera on the scene but he had shaved he was clean shaven in in the trial so he's on and he's describing in detail where her mom's body is how she was shot. Cloth was put over her face. She, to me, that's kind of disturbing testimony, and he was on direct. Not a peep. Not a peep from Carly. Not even a nervous twitch. She just looked bored. 
And this trial ain't been very long. I mean, it's not like she's sitting through weeks of this. Weeks of, no. This is happening rapid fire, rapid fire. Rapid fire. This is day three. This trial's almost completely over already. So we're just talking day one, day two. Day two, she that we've got this the first detective on the on the scene. He's on the stand, and he's describing things in detail. And they're talking about the video. Not a peep out of her. So just go back if if you're fascinated with trials like I am. Go back and skim through and see her, her how she reacts through different time periods. And again, I'll reiterate, this is, this is a rapid-fire case. This isn't weeks on end. Several weeks of trial where she's probably just worn down, and I would give her that. But no, this is fresh each day. And this is day three. And... It, or most of today, she seemed bored. She's cranking her head, yawning, sitting like this, sipping on her Diet Coke or whatever it is she's drinking. Apparently, she has. Now, I had asked the questions before. Is she still on medication? And yes, she is. They That answered my question. My question is, is when they, they started talking about this Zoloff, or, uh, not Zoloff, uh, Zolex, uh, this this other medication they put her on, and then what's the Abilify? When I'm kind of confused on when did she start the Abilify, or she was on the Zo Zolex for a month, he said, and then what? Then she went on the Abilify, or was she on the Abilify for ten grams a day? I. I Whatever. The point is, I guess she it answered my question that she still is taking medication and the voices had stopped. So she'd been hearing voices this whole time, people, according to this testimony. And no backup from from the stepdad. Wouldn't you think he would have mentioned that? Like when they said, well, how, how was her? How was her demeanor? How when they were direct asking him questions about her behavior? Has he seen anything? Noticed anything? Anything out of the ordinary? No. No. Nothing. Did he bring up? Yeah, she's been hearing voices. We got her on meds. Damn. He never said any of that. Why? Would he not? I, to me, I think that would have helped her case. Just saying. Based on your interview and observations of Carly and also your discussions with her family members, would you describe Carly as diabolical? No. Okay. Would you ever describe someone as diabolical that you're evaluating? I, I can't imagine that I would, no. And. Well, why not? If they are, they are. You're a psychiatrist. There are diabolical people. And again, I'm going to reiterate, uh, one of my family members diagnosed with schizophrenia, heard voices, and his voice, I didn't tell you this in other videos, was the voice of a woman. Sometimes he'd sit there and start laughing. I said, well, what are you laughing? She said something funny. I know. I know. It's creepy. It is creepy. Now, but this is the thing, that you have people in a household that know and aware if somebody has this type of illness, you, trust me, you see it. You see it. And he never, and her stepdad never saw it. Are we going to hear from the grandparents? Are they going to recall, because the... The defense said they didn't need the stepdad anymore so they could release him and he could probably sit in the courtroom. The prosecution says, no, 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 he's still up for recall. So I don't know if they're going to pull him back up and say, wait a minute. What, what is all this? When did you know she was hearing voices? 
What steps were taken? Did y'all ever feel afraid of her? And I think he was asked that question. Was he ever afraid of her? Or was Ashley afraid of Carly? These are all good points. Because, Deb, blame. You've got somebody displaying all of this. It is apparent in the household. And is she diabolical? Is she hiding it? Is she uh, lingering? Is that is that the word? Which means faking it? Now, he said she was minimizing, so was she smart enough to know, I need to hide all of these things from everybody? Like I told you, my family member knew when to shut up. And when, you know, whatever situation he was in, either to get himself out of trouble, because he knew. They, there's some intelligence there. I know it's bizarre. It, it's very bizarre. That's why these people need to be locked up forever. Because you could never trust them. They could come across as just a, an ordinary person. And then there's some creepiness going on inside. You would not know it. Now, he didn't do that in the home. He was creepy. We saw it. The thing is, is that her stepdad, my, my, I'm emphasizing this, says he never saw nothing. I haven't heard unless they're going to bring him back. Now that they're saying all this, well, did, what? Did you know she was hearing voices? I, I never heard him them ask him that question. I'm just inquiring minds. This is crazy. So what, if anything, did Carly tell you occurred on the Sunday prior to the incident of March 19th, which was a Tuesday? So Carly told me that she had been put on Lexapro on March 12th. And that she found that almost immediately, very quickly, her mood swings were worse. That she was having lower lows and higher highs um, in that week leading up to March 19th. She told me that the voices were getting worse, that they were becoming more urgent, more insistent, um, more of a problem for her. Um, and then she told me that on that Sunday, uh, March 17th, that she had smoked marijuana that morning, that her mother and stepfather had gone to the store, she was alone in the house, she'd smoked some marijuana, and that she had about a 20 minute experience where her thoughts were racing, her thoughts were jumbled, she was really frightened, uh, and she kind of fell to the floor because she wasn't sure that she was gonna be able to control her body. Um, she said it was a very scary experience for her, unlike something, anything she had before, and that um, um, it, after about 20 minutes it passed. And then she was sort of back to herself. Do you, I just had, it just occurred to me. Do you think the reason why they asked him, do you think Carly is diabolical? It's because of the video. It seemed deliberate. Her looking around the corner. Her aware of the camera. Her going to get the gun, her knowing that the mom is in her room, searching her room. I'm just guessing, all right? I am just making an assumption that why would they throw that? Do you think she's diabolical? After all of this litany of illnesses that are serious mental illness, right? And, and anyway, I would think anybody who's a schizophrenic can, can be diabolical because they're either they're they're hiding their their illness in front of certain people. Yes, that's diabolical. They're hiding stuff. They're hearing voices that tell them to hurt somebody. Fill a bathtub up. Well, the voice told me I should drown you. That that. There you go. But I just got to thinking, why would they ask her that? Being diabolical is not a diagnosis of a mental illness. I think it's just a 
maybe it's just a part of the psychosis to if if, if you're an evil person maybe you want to kill somebody for financial gain you're going to be diabolical and trying to plan it, I guess, right? That's diabolical. But was she diabolical? Why would they ask her that? I, guys, I think it's because of the video. She is creeping around. She's peeking around. She's hiding the gun from the camera. That's premeditated and diabolical. She could have stopped at any time, but she didn't. Because I guess I had asked this question on my last video. I'm waiting for him to say it. Did the voice tell her to do it? Now, they've already hit what all these different things are. Uh, command, orator, hallucin hallucinations, hurt yourself or someone else. If I got that right for that, for that type of psychosis. Or just schizophrenia in itself that she claims she's hearing voices. Now, he hadn't come right out and said, yeah, the voice told her to do it. Let's go. And how can we make sense of the fact that a low dose of a widely used antidepressant could have such an impact on Carly's symptoms so, so quickly? So the SSRI, the SSRI medications are widely used, generally considered safe, approved by the Food and Drug Administration, um, and, and most adolescents do just fine with them. They don't always work all that well, sometimes they do, um, but there are a small number of individuals that have dramatically bad responses to these medications, most particularly in terms of suicidality. Right, so, the, so, so there's a small number of individuals, it's thought to be maybe one or two percent of people that take the medication, where fairly quickly they can become quite suicidal, just kind of out of the blue. They had not been suicidal before, they're given a medication like Prozac, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden they, they get suicidal. So the Food and Drug Administration has mandated what's called a black box warning, which is that when you get your package insert from the medication, there's a thick, heavy black box that says warning you need to be worried about for individuals, um, um, uh, for, sorry, for adolescents from the ages of 16 to 24, you need to worry about the risk of suicidal ideation caused by this medication. For a long time, the Food Drug, Drug Administration recommended weekly meetings with your prescriber just to, just, to, just to check in. So, and I will say in my experience, I've had many, many patients who have reported going on an SSRI medication and just having an awful response. They say, I just, I just, just felt terrible and I had to stop it immediately. Um, so it's not common, but it, but it happens. Okay. And, and if I may, yes. for an individual, as I testified to earlier, with um, bipolar disorder, there's a risk that an antidepressant medication is gonna make them worse, gonna make their mood swings worse. It's gonna aggravate their mood difficulties. Would that be especially true if they are not already taking a mood stabilizing drug? Yes. And, and I think it's often the case that an individual, once their mood is stabilized by a mood stabilizing medication like Abilify, once their mood is stabilized, they're able to tolerate an antidepressant. Sometimes it really can be really helpful for them. So it's not surprising to me that Carly now is on a mood stabilizer medication, Abilify, and is able to tolerate Celexa, and the combination seems to work for her. What, if anything, did Mar did? Uh, Carly tell you about the events on March 19th? What Carly told me was that she had woken up that morning groggy and irritable. She had not smoked marijuana. She had a hard time paying attention in, in class the first time that that had happened. That she went to, um, she typically, that she typically got a ride home from her mother, who was a math teacher at the school, um, and so that she went to the mother's classroom at the end of that day, and um, that the mother, I guess, informed her um, that um, she knew that Carly had been smoking marijuana. Carly I told me that she said that, that her mother had a sixth sense about it. Um, I don't think that Carly knew, I, uh, that Carly knew that, that someone else, a friend of hers, had, had told the mother. But Carly told me that the mother knew um, that she'd been smoking marijuana, that they drove home as usual, um, that uh, when they got home, 
um, Carly went to the backyard to let the dogs out and that her memory went blank at that point. Um, and wow. I went ahead and stopped it just for a moment for a big wow. I did a, a hypothesis, a theory, in my last video, that I, I did know the mom knew before they left the school that a kid had informed her Carly's doing one thing or another. And that I assumed that Carly and her mother, her mother brought this up to her on the way home. I just assumed it because there had been no evidence prior to this that anybody state this. Because my theory was, why would Carly's mom go straight to her room if she hadn't already, she, she, because we, we, we did know that the boy had called the mom. We did, we did, I did know that. Okay. Whether, I don't know if I heard that in any testimony. Um, where did I hear that? Anyway, it doesn't matter. So I theorize she already has this information. They're on their way home and they're talking about it. And her mom is, I'm sure, not happy. They get home and we all saw the video. Now Carly says she goes outside. Now it looks like she let the dogs out, then back in and then back out. Did y'all know that? Did y'all see that? Maybe they should play the video again while he's talking about it. Because th I did want to hear what did he have to say about watching the video. Now, okay, well, I just paused it. He says, Carly said she went blank at that point. I think this <laughs> is going to get very interesting. And that her memory came back as she was standing by the side of the road, having crawled out of the, uh, a drainage pipe, wet, and the police officer came by and, and picked her up. Um, so she said that, 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 that for that period of time, she had no memory whatsoever uh, of what had happened. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> I don't believe it. And I'm going to tell you why. Remember the video of the officer who found her on the side of the road, which the defense tried to disclaim him because he turned off the audio of his camera. So on his camera, his camera is the one filming her get the, uh, the swab, RS whatever the technical name, whatever. They're, they're, they're looking for the gunpowder residue on her hands. And she's like, what is this? And he says, oh, they're checking to see if you have gunpowder residue on your hands. And then he said, well, which hand did you, did you shoot with? And she said, I think it was this one. Now, he just said Carly told him. She went blank from when the moment she went outside to let the dogs out. So that means she's completely blank while she's doing all that craziness in the house. Then she leaves. She goes and runs away with her friend. Crawls. I was wondering how she got all soaking wet. Crawls and hides in a drainage ditch. And then miraculously when she crawls out of the drainage ditch, she's standing on the side of the road and all her memories come back. So if that's true, wouldn't she be in complete shake and shock of the realization? Well, no, no, no. Let's back this up because she's still claiming she didn't do it. So, so she's standing on the side of the road. All of a sudden, now she her memory comes back. But what does she ask him? She asks that guy, well, how's my stepdad? It wasn't, how's my mother? So then... Okay, so her memory comes back. She's not in a fog, but now she remembers the fog. How does that work? Well, I, it seems like a dream. Maybe she could say that. It felt like a dream. But she didn't ask while she was standing there getting her hands wiped down for 
gun residue, she asked about her stepdad. She did not mention her mother. And the guy said, I can't talk about that with you, baby. And he called her baby. said, I can't talk about that with you, baby. I can't comment on that. Hmm. This is... I don't know. Now, I haven't experienced, I'll be honest, a family member saying that they completely blacked out. No. No. It's quite the opposite. They imagine something happening that didn't happen, and then they respond to it. Like, oh, you hit me with a bat while I was sleeping? <laughs> or some food's gone out of the refrigerator? You ate my food? Who ate it? Well, obviously it's gone. You ate it. <laughs> no. I to 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 say that I, I never experienced that in a family member that they they comp said they blacked out. No, it was either. Well, me, I think it's a dream, but to them, they think something was real, and then they act upon it. But never. But I guess all psychoses are different, obviously. Now, Dr. Clark, were you in the courtroom earlier today? I was. Okay. And what, if anything, did you hear about Carly disclosing, uh, Carly having disclosed uh, to a friend about her auditory delusions? So what I heard this morning was that Carly's friend, SK, reported or testified that Carly had told her before the incident that she was hearing voices. We also have the um, her journal entry. And were you also in the courtroom when some body camera body camera footage was played? Yes. What if anything stood out to you about that? I think the only thing that stood out was that Carly was. It sounded to me as if Carly was concerned about the welfare of her stepfather. And. Were you able to hear anything on the body camera footage uh, in regards to Carly's answer when they asked her, when they were doing the gunpowder residue test, and they asked her, you know, which hand she used to shoot a gun? Do you, do you recall what her response I actually was? didn't hear that particular response. She said this okay. one. She said which hand. Um, what, if anything, did you observe about Carly's grief? So what I observed was that Carly, even though she said her mood was well, stable for the first time in years, that she continued to miss her mother very much. Um, uh, yeah, that, she, that, that she, she, she missed her mother very much and that she had been really having a very difficult time uh, in the time since the incident. That's, to me, that answer was vague. To me, that answer was vague. I mean, if... It would seem like he would say, she is just overwhelmed with grief. Obviously, she is not. She just misses her mother very much, and she's having a difficult time. Then maybe that's because he's a doctor and he's more clerical in how he's speaking. But... That's the, the severity of what she has done. She'd be a nervous wreck every day. And not being able to sleep. Dark circles under your eyes. Good Lord. You blew your mother's face off with a three fifty seven Magnum. Are you kidding me? So, we have more medication. Yes, it answered my question. She was still on medication. I don't recall hearing nothing from the stepdad about her hearing voices, and not until now, probably because the defense or the prosecution did not bring it up. But I think I would, if I was the jury, I would want to know, when you ask the stepdad, have you seen anything in the mood change or anything different about her? The only thing I recall he saying is that she was, she was depressed. That's it. He didn't say... Well, she was severely depressed, and she was hearing voices. I mean, he should have said all that, but he didn't. He didn't. Is, do you think your wife was scared of her? No, she wasn't scared of her. No, they did not talk about all of these, these, 
horrible mental illnesses with the stepdad. That would have opened the door for it when they asked her, did you see, asked him, have you seen her angry? Did you, any changes in her behavior? No. Just, she was just depressed and we were treating her for depression. Do, how much medication? Do you know what medication? He's like, no. He didn't know what it was. He didn't see her taking it. None of that. Diabolical. Why would they? Why did the, would the defense ask that? I think they know that that's how that's what's going to happen with the uh, probably with the closing. She was diabolical in her behavior. Now they just said. Now they could just say, "Well, she went blank. She went blank." Hey, look. Even if she did go blank. Let's just say, I'm going to say hypothetically, all of this is legit to her psychosis. She should be locked up forever. I'm telling you. And we need to be doing this more across the country. These people can be dangerous. Anyway, that's going to conclude part four. I guess this is part four. I think it is, guys. Uh, <laughs> of day three. And looking forward to the rest of it. Thank you.